So, uh, my name is Tadja Müller. I work for the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation on Climate and Energy Issues, and I'm talking to Ken Henshaw from Social Action Nigeria. And uh, we want to speak today about the interrelationship between climate change and the causes of armed conflict. And you've been doing some research into armed conflict in Nigeria and the connection to climate change. So, what's the story on that? Uh, well, um, the res researches we've carried out for a while now indicates that the there's you know, serious relationship between armed conflict, religious extremism, um, certain levels of fundamentalism, conflict, insurgency, with you know, climate, with climate, climatic issues, right? Um, just like the relationship between, I mean, the conclusion we have come to is if for whatever reason, people's sources of livelihood get taken away, either through pollution um, or through, as this case, uh, um, encroachment of the desert, the shrinking of their sources of livelihood, if that ever happens, people tend to become more desperate, you know, become more desperate, become frustrated, uh, tend to, you know, have a feeling of fatality, which sometimes leads them to religion and sometimes religious extremism. And it goes, you know, and our research seems to indicate that that's actually the case in some areas in Nigeria. Because when we spoke a few days ago, you mentioned that the region that has seen the emergence of Boko Haram, the... Nigerian Islamist militants yeah. is actually not a region that has a, a history of, of, of radical Islam, but actually is one where, where very moderate uh, religious forces tended to prevail historically. Absolutely, absolutely. I was surprised that, I mean, it's, I must first say that religious extremism has, um, has been unfortunately a, a constant future in the Nigerian political and religious landscape. But the reality is that the area where Boko Haram um, has gained prominence and strength is hardly the area where um, religious fundamentalism is known for. You know, mm. the Bono and Yobe axis are hardly the areas where, you, uh, where religious extremism you know, flourishes. The reality is that we need to look at Boko Haram from a different perspective altogether. The growth, the rise and the strength of Boko Haram in that part of Nigeria is traceable to some other factors. And for us, our research indicates that it is traceable to the total disappearance, almost near total disappearance of the Lake Chad. Now the Lake Chad has shrunk uh, to a twentieth of its size, you know, from a massive lake which cuts across three countries, uh, well, four countries, Chad, Niger, Cameroon and Nigeria. It has shrunk to a very tiny dot on the landscape, okay? Prior to this time, about, what, 30 years ago, Lake Chad used to be a major source of irrigation, water for irrigation, and this irrigation will, you know, uh, f um, support farm. So we had a very large thriving farming population around the Lake Chad region. There was also a thriving fishing population around, around the Lake Chad region, and uh, the gr growing of livestock, the keeping of livestock was also a very thriving trade. People could keep livestock because there was, there, were, there was vegetation for them to eat, there was water for them to drink and all that, right? But with the shrinking, with the gradual shink, shrinking of Lake Chad, um, to what it, it is now, a twentieth of its size. As it shrunk, livelihood options disappeared. As it shrunk, fishing came to an end. As it shrunk, um, farming came to an end. As it shrunk, the rearing of uh, livestock came to an end. And so generally, the people who live around the, the Lake Chad region were left um, basically desolate, I mean, without any source of livelihood and, and, and so on. And like I said earlier, when people do not have a means to survive the next day, the next week, and the next month. There's a sense in which they get frustrated. There's a sense in which they feel a certain level of fatality, helplessness, hopelessness. And in that case, when there is any iota of religious ideology mm. that tends to present some kind of alternative, there's a tendency for them to, to jump at it. I think that it is for this reason that religious extremism has flourished in the Lake Chad region. I think it's actually the, the, the research that's been done on the conflict in Syria actually tells a very similar story because I mean, we're now in Paris in a city that's scarred by the after effects of the conflicts in the, in the, in the Middle East. And, um, and Germany has just decided to enter uh, alongside France and, and Great Britain and the US into the intervention in Syria. And it's a story in Germany that's not very widely, it's a story that's not very widely known in Germany and beyond, yeah. that there is a strong correlation also between climate change and climate change induced drought and the conflict in Syria. Because the research is basically like this. Any actual armed conflict is always multi-causal. It's caused by a variety of factors. But there is a consistent correlation between spikes in food prices on the global markets and 
violent conflicts and uprisings in northern Africa and the Middle East. And in Syria, there is there was a drought from 2007 to 2010, which was the worst drought in the history of record keeping. And that led to obviously uh, worse harvests, the death of livestock that pushed a lot of people from the, sit from, from the rural areas into the cities, which then exacerbated existing distributive conflicts there and was one of the triggers of the Syrian uprising, which then fed into religious extremism in exactly, I think, the way you said. And so, when we're talking here about climate justice, we're really talking about peace and armed conflict as well. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I agree. Um, and the scenario you painted is exactly what we think our research has, has indicated has happened in Nigeria, you know. And um, I, I think it's, um, it, 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 it's basically going to grow the way it seems, right? Because um, with, with zero solutions being come up with, you know, here at Paris, with the heads of government still dilly-dialing, not taking any strong position, it's likely that what we're seeing in terms of the climate is going to get even worse. You know, um, more sources of livelihood are going, going to disappear. More and more people are going to be pushed into religious extremism. And even those who ordinarily would not become religious extremists, right, they tend to be more susceptible to recruitment, you know, by religious extremists because there's nothing else to do. So the question people need to start asking for those who still doubt the relationship between um, um, climate change and conflict is why is it so easy for a sect like Boko Haram with a very dangerous ideology as it has, right, to recruit? Why is it so easy for them to recruit in that particular region where poverty and destitution has reached its peak? So what would you, what would you say is the one thing, the central thing that could be done either here in Paris or in the many local struggles around climate justice to actually prevent these kinds of armed conflicts? What is the one central element? Well, as long as there's a relationship between um, climate change and, and armed conflicts, the reality is that the, 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 one, the one fixed solution has got to be stopping you know, uh, climate change, stopping this, 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 thing, this change that is taking away livelihoods, that is basically destroying the planet. I think that strong decisions need to be taken. I think that we need to, I think what we need is something close to some kind of shock therapy, something that wakes people up out of their slumber, something that wakes the nation, the, 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 the heads of government out of their slumber. I think that we really need to cap emissions completely. I think that eventually we need to leave fossil fuel in the ground. Thank you very much, Ken. I think that's exactly the agenda that we need to be talking about here. <laughs>